Welcome to talks by members of the Survey and Cartography section of the National Speleological Society. These videos are intended to be how-to videos on cave survey software and other programs used by cavers in the exploration and documentation of the world beneath our feet. We'll go ahead and get started. So we've had uh, several talks, obviously, over the uh, over the past month plus, and uh, you know we've been working our way through a couple different software packages, um, namely the uh, QGIS software that we started with, and then we moved on to uh, some specific cave software that we had, uh, you know the Caveware software that uh, Philip uh, Schuhart wrote and then Andy Edwards with Breakout and we've had uh, another session in there where we did kind of a ask me anything show and tell session which was very popular with the participants and then we also uh, have had uh, uh, other requests for like walls talks for uh, compass talks and and so on and so forth so what I thought I'd do tonight is kind of con continue our discussion on uh, that front and the uh, let me do one thing here before we get any farther uh, I'm going to stop my video so that we're just seeing the screen continue on to the that theme of GIS and kind of how to's we've had some demos and things but one of the things I really want to to keep us grounded on with the uh, with the software is kind of the whole how to button clicking of GIS, which seems to be, uh, you know, can be intimidating, can be a mysterious thing if you're not comfortable or not familiar with those environments. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about a uh, a new entry. You know, that's a relative term that's been around now for, for over five years, but a, a piece of software called ArcGIS Pro. ArcGIS Pro is the latest incarnation of the ArcGIS software suite uh, from Esri. Many of you know Bern Sukowski, and he's been a fantastic friend and uh, colleague to many of us in the caving community. He works at the company that created ArcGIS, a company called Esri or ESRI, and, uh, and there's a long uh, history of cavers using ArcGIS to make uh, different uh, map products, be them overlays, uh, all the way up to finished maps inside of, of the Esri suite of tools. Most cavers, if they've had exposure to the ArcGIS tools, um, probably have had uh, experience with tools in the ArcGIS desktop suite, which involves tools like ArcMap and Arc Catalog and uh, ArcScene and Spatial Analyst and 3D Analyst and a whole whole host of different add-ons that could go with uh, the ArcGIS desktop. One of the one of the real limitations of the ArcGIS uh, desktop suite though is that it's a 32-bit program and it was slow especially with large data, data sets and uh, had some other limitations with processing uh, data that were related to that and ArcGIS Pro is a native 64-bit application and whenever Esri rewrote the engine for ArcGIS they moved everything over to what's called the ribbon interface and we're going to talk about uh, ribbon interface tonight which is if you're familiar with the Microsoft Office suite of products it's all of these icons across the top each icon typically has several different drop downs that exist within it and this replaces um, the notion of having toolbars all over your screen and so forth so that's that's kind of the the origins of all of that it's said to be more efficient and I think you know the the limited research that I've seen that have been done with users is that new users to the arc suite of products um, tend to favor and like the ribbon interface and like the way ArcGIS Pro works, um, people who had already had experience with ArcGIS Pro, or I'm sorry, ArcGIS Desktop, ArcMap, Arc Catalog, and so forth, um, were a little more resistant to it, and I think that probably is 
is not surprising. You know, we get set in our ways of how we like to work with our software, and that's when we see, uh, you know, our way is better than an alternative way. Uh, and that's certainly not unique to GIS. You see that with different versions of Illustrator or drawing programs and cave survey programs for that matter over the generations. Um, but here we are, this is the new version. And I just thought I'd spend a little bit of time tonight going over some of the things that cavers like to do in, in GIS and do those things inside of Arc Pro. And so uh, the first thing, I tell you what, let's just, um, let's just exit out here and I'll restart ArcGIS Pro here so we can see how these things uh, happen from the get-go. So we'll start up ArcGIS Pro. One of the things that you'll notice immediately about ArcGIS Pro if you choose to use it is that you need to log in to uh, your organization. And so I belong to several organizations because I teach GIS and have been a part of other uh, of projects that, that have access to ArcGIS Pro. Uh, and if you're wondering, you know, this is out of reach because it's really expensive, um, you should know that you can actually get access for about 100 bucks a year, uh, which includes the updates you may have seen up here. It said that uh, there was an update waiting for me to download to the software. But from the get-go, the interface is very different. In ArcGIS Pro, it uses uh, templates the same way that Arc Desktop used templates, but uh, it, it differs in the way that you access those templates. And so we're just gonna start a blank map and I need to give that map a name and I need to give it a location uh, on my hard drive for, uh, for storing data. So I can give it uh, a name and uh, let's see here, let's go back to trying to talk and do things at the same time. And then we give it, um, so the, the cave I have that I use in, uh, in the survey and cartography talks is called Flat Cave. So I may just create a new project called Flat Cave. And a lot of things are happening here is it says create project. And so it's opening up my project, but at the same time, it's creating a default data store, uh, directory structure, and you can see that it automatically loaded in a background map here that we can zoom in, zoom out on. Uh, this is one of many background maps. I'll talk a little bit more about background maps. But this is our starting point for, uh, for a project in ArcGIS Pro. Uh, if I go to the catalog uh, widget here, I look under my folders, I see I have a, already have a flat cave folder and I have a flat cave, what's called a geodatabase. Uh, Geodatabase is kind of an updated container uh, uh, structure that ArcGIS Pro uses. And you could use it in ArcGIS too, but ArcGIS Pro uses. And this would be analogous to um, a, a container or database full of like shape files. And so you can put shape files into the Geodatabase or you can add your shape files, which I'll do here in a moment. You can add your shape files directly into your project. So you, you're not mandated that you have to use the geodatabase, but as your projects get bigger and more complicated, it's sometimes beneficial to use the, the geodatabase just for, for uh, uh, data management and organization and so forth. Uh, you can also see that there's a toolbox here. This is if I were to write any custom scripts or, or something called a model uh, through a utility called Model Builder. Uh, in order to automate steps in my workflow, those would be stored in my toolbox. And then I have some logs and things that can be stored as well. I still have access to all my other drives and all my other folders on my computer. These are just the, dri the, the folders that are created uh, when you create a project in ArcGIS Pro. And if you look in the, the little window here, it tells you the date and time that happened, and then the full path on the hard drive where there were that project's being stored. That might be on your drive, might be on a network drive and so forth. You create any custom styles, those will also be st stored in, uh, in uh, your project. And then you can uh, have multiple maps and multiple layouts, which we'll get to 
uh, in due course. But so that's that's kind of the ten thousand foot overview. All the dialog boxes or widgets in ArcGIS Pro, you uh, can dock them, you can float them, so you can pull this dialog box off. I know um, I've had uh, colleagues and worked with students in the past that maybe are left-handed and want to have a completely different arrangement of their monitor for their workflow. That's completely okay. You can dock these things. Uh, you see all four sides of the monitor. A lot of people that use GIS day in and day out will have dual monitors. They may want to pull some of the tools over onto a second monitor and have them always present. But the way you dock a, uh, a panel that's floating around is you just drag it over to whatever icon you want to dock that, that panel to. Um, and then you can do an auto hide and the auto hide just tucks it away uh, over here on the, on the side of your screen. So it's still there. It's just not on the on the screen all the time. And this saves you real, real estate. You know, if you wanna make the map your focus of your project, you don't want your whole working area continually narrowed down by uh, lots of menus and, and dialogue boxes and stuff. Um, along those lines, the, the panel along the left over here is called the contents. Some, some people also call it the table of contents. This is where all your layers and everything are gonna be found. Uh, but you can see here, I can resize that as well. If I want to uh, reclaim some map area on the screen, uh, my mouse wheel works uh, in here. And I've got some tools up here where I can uh, zoom in and zoom to, to specific locations and so forth. Um, so usually the first thing that uh, cavers wanna do in GIS is they wanna add their shapefile data and shapefile data, um, comes from one of the cave survey programs here in the US. Um, the most popular ones seem to be Compass and Walls, uh, but there, there are obviously other programs out there. Some of them can write uh, shapefiles directly and some of them you may have to go through an additional step to get uh, data into a shapefile or GIS compatible format. Um, I know uh, some tools are now using Spatial Light uh, or the Geo Packages, which is a flavor of Spatial Light. Um, and we can certainly have talks in the future about that. That's not what this talk tonight's about. But um, you know, we'll we'll start with a with a a shapefile kind of data format. So if you've used ArcGIS, and I'll I'll keep referring back to ArcGIS for people who might be familiar with it, but um, I'm not expecting you to have used ArcGIS in the past. If you have used GIS in the past, you may recognize some of the icons, although they're they're slightly modified, but the black plus sign here has is, is long been the icon in Esri products to add data. So again, we're in the ribbon interface. So whenever we click on add data, it gives us all the options for adding data to our map. Some of those things may be uh, found online. Some of those things may be in text files, comma separated or text files. This would be like GPS coordinates, things of that uh, nature. Um, and some of these are not gonna ever be uh, something that we probably use in caving. Um, addressing and geocoding, probably not. Could though, and, but it's there if we need it. But what we wanna do is add some data to our map. So I'll just click on the add data tool. And what's gonna happen there is it's gonna show me uh, all the folders on, on my computer. Now remember we had our folders here that were set up as a part of our project, uh, but those are empty right now, so there's no data in there. And so I can browse to anywhere on my computer. Here's a folder that I, I have some data from a previous talk, uh, and I've got some stations and some vectors. So using my, holding down my control key, uh, since this is Windows, I can select multiple files and click OK, and those uh, data layers will be added into my project. Um, so it zooms me into those layers that I just added. I still have my my background layer there, and if I zoom out, um, you can kind of see its relationship to the to the world. Um, now, this is a cave that that is a real cave, but it's not in a real location. At least, it's not really there. Um, this is we're out in the middle of Kansas somewhere here. That uh, my made up cave for for presentations. Uh, but we can do lots of things with our data at this point. You know, one thing that we might want to do is say you know, this background is kind of washed out. It's not really doing it for me. And so I want to come back to map 
and go to my base maps and see what I might be able to add as a background layer to uh, to get a little bit better context for my map. So here I'm just adding an imagery layer and uh, and then I can see kind of seamless imagery and I can pan on that imagery and zoom in and zoom out and so forth. Um, now having done that, I have a little bit of a problem though because I can't see my line work very easily. So I probably wanna make some adjustments to my colors. Uh, these are colors that are just assigned by default. So it's just a starting point. And I mentioned this when I gave my talk on QGIS, is that you sh rarely should be using the default options in any GIS software package. They are only meant to be a starting point, not the perfect choice, certainly. And, uh, you know, it can almost always be improved upon. So, uh, you know, you want to make sure you understand how to improve upon them. There are lots of ways to get to the the symbology or the, the color and, and weight and so forth of the graphics that you see in your layers. I think, I happen to think one of the easiest ways is you just move your cursor over the swatch or the line or the point or whatever here in the, in the contents pane and you click on that and that'll bring up the contents pane. So these are all the styles that are built into ArcGIS Pro and I can certainly select any one of these and change it just to whatever that symbology is with the click of a mouse, you know, if I want a thicker line or so forth. Uh, but I also have control up here in my uh, widget uh, options to, to work on just the raw appearance of that. So I can say, well, you know, I think yellow is going to be a better color for me and that line's a little bit too thick. So I'm going to bump that down a couple points and I want to apply those changes. And so I can, I can have full control over the, the look and, and so forth of any geometry that I have. So here we just change the, the vectors or the survey shots, um, but we can do the same thing for our, our points here and pull up that symbology and say, you know, well, you know, red dot might be good. I'm not really sure about the weight. Okay, uh, you know, everybody picks circles. Let's see if we can do better. I'll go back to the gallery and say, you know, how about triangles? Yeah, I like triangles. So we'll we'll keep that one. And so the other thing that you can do here, of course, is if you pick something out of the gallery in ArcGIS Pro, um, again, it's just a starting point. We can pop back over to properties and say, you know, I like what's going on with my triangles, but I'd really rather have them be blue. And so then you can just change that parameter of the symbology that you see on the screen. So it's it's pretty slick. It's pretty easy to do all of that. Uh, and it's in a very compact interface. Again, you know, this is something that I use even on like a laptop screen pretty effectively. So we have some stations and we have some line work on the screen. And again, we can, uh, we can zoom in, we can zoom out uh, with, with our data set and pan around on our data set. Uh, you know, next thing that a lot of cavers will want to do is add some station labels just so they can get oriented to their line plot. Uh, and the way we would do that and access the label features uh, is to right mouse click on the layer name and come down here where it says label. We wanna label everything. Say, well, you know, I picked this default, it's black. Maybe that text is a little bit small. So now I wanna to go to my labeling properties. Again, that's gonna pop up a, a screen for me here. Right now it's just pulling the feature name. This data comes from wall, so it happens to be the station name, but it could be any of the parameters that you have out of your out of your uh, survey program. And again, we have access to the symbology of that, the uh, appearance of that. Right now, that's clearly all uh, black text. Maybe we wanna make it white uh, to show up a little bit better against the background. And uh, I don't like Tahoma. You know, I wanna pick, uh, let's just pick, that and maybe I want to bump it up a little bit and yeah so you know make my changes and then I'll apply those changes and I'll see that automatically updated on the screen here. So that's a pretty common task that uh, that folks want to be able to do uh, whenever they get into GIS because this now gives them stations if they know that there's a lead at A9 way back up here 
you know, maybe I want to go out and start hiking around on the surface and try to find, uh, you know, find a back door, find a sinkhole or a spring over here or something to get into the, the cave a different way. Or if there's a, a proposed development up here, you know, somebody said bought this piece of property and they're thinking about, you know, digging a basement uh, in the ground out here, you know, I can share that information with them. And, and, you know, if I have my elevation data and I have my cave data here, if we click on that, we can see that the Z value here is that, uh, you know, has an elevation and an XY, and we can go in and, and figure out how deep the cave is at that at that particular location. So lots of options to be able to work with data here. Um, and then also, you know, looking at uh, different characteristics of the of the data that we might have. If we want to go an additional step, um, which was covered in a previous talk on georeferencing, and add the raster map to the cave, we can do that. Uh, or if we've drawn the cave in a vector software, we can register those vectors to our line plot in uh, ArcGIS Pro as well. Um, let's see, so we covered uh, shape files. we've covered how to get some background layers. One thing that I talked about in QGIS that's not as easy to do in ArcGIS Pro is add Bing maps as your background layer. You have to have a what's called a software key from uh, Microsoft to be able to do that. You can get that software key from them, but uh, it, it can be a kind of a complicated process and something that's not generally 100% uh, successful all the time. So, you know, you're, you're looking at being able to use um, the background maps that are, that are built in here with, uh, with ArcGIS Pro, or you can do something like add data from their uh, what's called a, a living atlas project. So if we go to data from path, I'm sorry, let's try that again. Um, we are adding some people to the call here too. Stick with me for just a second. We can go to uh, portals. And you know we can we can have uh, access to lots of, of data that's published by ESRI and by others. Um, some of this is going to be applicable. Some of it's not. If you want to add your NAEP imagery to to your map, you can do that. If you're not familiar with NAEP, NAEP is a, a infrared imagery that can show you moisture retention of vegetation and so forth. So what it's happening right now is it's going out, it's finding that server on the internet, it's finding the actual, uh, what's called the uh, bounding box or the the um, parameters that we need, and then hopefully returning them. Now, the fact that this says this container is empty tells me either that's no longer available or it's uh, offline right now for some reason. Um, so let's try something else here. Uh, and we'll search for um, elevation. So, you know, if I want elevation added to my map, I can just look and see what's online through the portal. Um, not all of this is gonna to, uh, cover the entire earth. Here's some stuff that's specific to the Arctic. Um, there's some bathymetry data up here. So that's all going to be underwater stuff. Um, some of it's going to be specific to other areas of the world. Here's some some Asian maps, another Arctic DEM. Uh, but some of it is uh, applicable. Like here's a world hillshade. So if we want to add a hillshade to our map, we can go out and grab that data and then, you know, have a hillshade pretty easily added to our map that we can print and uh, potentially export back to Illustrator. Let's say we're making a little location map or something to go with our Illustrator map. We could do that uh, directly from here. And if I was to make a, a hillshade map, you know, I've got a couple of challenges here. One is I probably don't want my uh, contours on there. And now all of a sudden my yellow lines that look good against the aerial photo don't look so good against the hillshade. So that's when I would come in and say, okay, let's pick uh, 
let's pick a color that's going to pop against that hill shade a little bit better and uh, and look at it the other thing of course that cavers like to do is find out you know where the cave's headed uh, with regards to the terrain so this might be a uh, you know a good a good place to look and say well you know the cave entrance might be down here it's in this side valley comes in and oh my gosh it stops right here at this at this ridge line you know is there a change in geology here that we need to know about are we wasting our time to try to find a way on in this cave or or what's happening here so those are all things that you can do uh you know in gis with with just a couple clicks of the button really we added uh, vectors we added the hill shade and we're ready to go on that um so those are all things that i think cavers like to to uh explore and do inside of GIS in general and certainly ArcGIS Pro uh, can do those things and it can do obviously much much more. Uh, we can uh, take this data actually yeah we can take this data and as I showed you earlier you can uh, just by point and click you can click on any piece of geometry and get all of its information so you know that vector is uh, from station A16 to A17. Uh, here's the, the center point of the survey shot has an elevation. Here's the length and azimuth and the inclination. Uh, it tells me what survey that was on um, and any other information that you might have uh, available to you. Now we can go in and we can add additional attributes to that in ArcGIS and, and QGIS and things like that too. Uh, but this is the information that you're gonna get by default whenever you export it out of one of the cave survey software programs or, or things that look like this. Depending on your program, these, these attribute names might be slightly different, but generally speaking, this is the type of, of characteristics. Now you might say, where's all of my LRUD data on here, my left, right, up and down. Um, those aren't characteristics that are attached to survey shots typically. Those would be on our survey station, so we would add our our stations back in and then if we selected one of those now we can see our left right and up and downs and so if you're clicking on something and it's not giving you what you want uh, make sure you're clicking on what you think you're clicking on and it may just be a matter of adjusting a little bit uh, so here you can see I don't get the azimuth I don't get the shot length but I do get um, my left right up and down and so forth so lots of different uh, ways to access information inside of, of GIS. So we talked about that. We talked about uh, labeling features. Um, a couple other things that the cavers like to do from here is then uh, take and uh, share data or get that data out into a different program that might be uh, Illustrator, might be something else. Um, so we can definitely export that information out uh, to other uh, types of, of software. So let's see here. If we come back and uh, look at our layouts, we can add a new layout. Uh, these are, again, just templates. They're built in. They're starting points. They don't have to, you don't have to necessarily stick to this, but uh, they can be a good handy starting point for us to uh, to begin to lay out a map. And so when we start a layout in ArcGIS Pro, this part, for those of you that are familiar with ArcGIS Desktop and specifically with ArcMap, this is gonna feel very different and foreign to you. If you're not familiar with those tools, you'll probably think this is uh, like, of course, why wouldn't you do it that way? Uh, but, uh, you know, when you start a layout, you just get a blank sheet of paper. And so the first thing that most people wanna do is insert their map frame. So this is going to tie back to the the map that we were just looking at, but now we're looking at it in a what's called a WYSIWYG or what you see is what you get kind of uh, format. So I draw an extent and then I get my, my map. Now I can still zoom in on this map, I can still pan around on this map and so forth, but this is the, the default view that we had back over here in our in our map view. We're just showing it now on our layout. And we have full control over this layout. You know, if we want to change all of its properties around, uh, we can do that pretty easily. Uh, whether we do it dynamically by resizing using the handles. Again, if you're familiar with 
tools like Illustrator or the Microsoft Office products, resizing boxes by arrows is probably very familiar to you. Uh, but we can do it exactly too. So if, if our publication or our uh, our standards for our project say, you know, we we maintain a half inch border all the way around our map, then I can just type those numbers in and give it a starting point and then say, okay, uh, my sheet is eight and a half inches wide since we're in the US, a half inch on each side equals one inch. So I need a width of seven and a half. And then same for, uh, uh, I did that backwards because I was again talking and not paying attention. So our seven and a half goes up here. And then our height is going to be 11 minus a half on the top minus a half on the bottom. And that's going to give us a height of 10. And so by keying those numbers in, uh, you are assured that you have exactly a half inch border all the way around your map. And that's something that's pretty handy if you're trying to uh, maintain standards and, and get things exactly the way you want them. Now, if we use the zoom tool here, all this is gonna do is get us closer or more distant from the sheet of paper. That's not allowing me to zoom in on my map the, may, the way I maybe want to. If I want to zoom in on my map, uh, you know, I have to activate my map frame and then my zoom tool is going to allow me to zoom in on my cave map a little bit more. I can say, okay, now that I'm looking at my layout, I've changed my background layer and everything else. Um, I've got a problem now with my labels. So I'm going to come back to my label properties and say, you know what? Um, we really do need to go back to black. And then that'll allow me to see uh, all my labels once again on my map. So I can set that up and then, uh, you know, I can say, okay, uh, come back to my, my layout. So let's go um, close our map activation, which gets us back into layout mode. And from here, I can say, okay, I wanna add a north arrow. And here's all the built-in North Arrows. Uh, if you were listening to my QGIS talk, I uh, declared that all built-in North Arrows are substandard. I encourage you to make your own North Arrows. You can add uh, your North Arrow from a JPEG or SVG or something here. Um, in the interest of time tonight, I think I'll just pick uh, uh, one of the built-in North Arrows. And then you have to say where you wanna place that North Arrow. So you can, uh, you can expand it. If you notice here, as I enlarge it, it's slightly rotated and that's because my map is slightly rotated. So it's in alignment with north per my map, not with the page that we're on, if that makes sense. Um, and so uh, I've got a north arrow, and then I'll come back to insert and say, okay, we need a scale bar. I'm a big fan of the alternating scale. It's called the alternating scale bar. I think they look uh, look nicer on the screen. So I'll pick one of those and add that. And then I can go in and alter the properties of my scale bar here, all the all the distances. And if I want kilometers, I can change that to kilometers here and change the label and say, okay, I don't really like the word kilometers out here on the end. So instead of the after, I'm going to put that below and I can continue to refine this down into into whatever it needs to be, up to and including um, adjusting the uh, the width of it based on a on a division value. So if I want to say, okay, uh, I want to hard code in half kilometer values. Gosh, you know that looks pretty uh, pretty big for this map. But okay, we're going to reduce it down and see what we got. So you know, I might I might just have to come to terms with that's too big. So I can go back into my properties and say, okay, let's instead make that uh, a tenth of a kilometer. Still a little bit big, but fits on the map and I can start to uh, fine tune what I want on my map. I can also add uh, text. So I can add dynamic or, or just a piece of text here onto my map. So, you know, flat earth cave. And then I can come in and resize that text. Let's change its uh, 
font here to something a little bit bigger. And let's see. expand that out so we can see it. So you don't have to make your all of your text the same size. I can select all that. I can select parts of that and change, um, you know, so I can make this if I want it to be big and a different color. I can do that or I can make it all the same. You have complete complete control over all that. And wherever you want that then to be on your map, you just move it around. So it's a very kind of drag and drop kind of interface that uh, that Pro provides for producing layouts. So once we have all of our layouts and everything ready, um, you know, we may want to uh, share that out and we can export that layout. Uh, I mentioned SVG. Uh, we can also export that layout to TIFF, to PDF, to JPEG. Um, and these are, if you've worked with any software, all these things look probably very familiar to you. So lots of options for exporting out our maps uh, in Pro as well. The, uh, I think one of the last things I want to talk about is um, what's, uh, let's see here. Creating, so we got a couple questions here. Uh, well, one comment. Uh, definitely make your own North Arrow. Yes, we are absolutely in alignment on that. And uh, how easy is it to create your own style templates? Um, I went through how to create style templates on QGIS. I believe, I believe, just my opinion, I believe it's an easier process in uh, QGIS just through the interface. Uh, you, that's probably a talk for a different time, how to make custom line styles. And so I've been building a, a cave symbol uh, style set for QGIS. And there, so yeah, let me, uh, let's see if we can, uh, if we can pull that up. Let's come back to our gallery. And so if we type in cave in our gallery, uh, we may have to go online to get it. But there, there's a way to bring in your cave sets in Esri and they're created in Esri by uh, the team that, that Burn is interacted with and supported over time. Um, hey, Aaron. Yeah. Where'd you pull down the north there and the bar scales? How'd you get to them? So whenever you're in layout mode. Yeah. Uh, you want to go to the insert uh, panel up here, pull down, whatever you want to call it. The insert ribbon. And then over here where it says map surrounds, that's uh -huh. where you're going to grab your north arrow. That's where you'll grab your scale bar. And then the third one here that map should have is the legend. Which okay. you, and you position on onto your map. So you have complete control over which items come out into the legend and so forth uh, as well. All right, thanks. Sure. So um, just to finish that up, yeah, Trish, I think it's it's a uh, not as straightforward process um, to create your own line styles. It certainly doesn't work the same way it would in say Illustrator but it is doable. And uh, the nice thing is, you know, once you do it once, then it's done. And so that's a place where you may have one person that has a little bit more GIS experience that creates your line styles, or you rely on the community uh, libraries that are made and then uh, use that as your starting point. Definitely possible though. So here's a here's a dialog box that I've not used very much, so it's not set up to auto hide yet, and so it's still out on the screen here. I can turn it into an auto hide. Um, so I've been going back and forth to get like my my layer properties and so forth, but you'll see that these are building up. Hopefully it's on on the on the screen there, but these are building up and they are uh, available here to me just by a click of a button uh, once once I have them. So it's not a matter of 
you're required to get to it that way, but you can get there through, uh, through different methods inside of ArcGIS. And so one of the things I'd like to say about ArcGIS, it's usually not a question of if something's possible, it's a, more of a question of like, there's like three ways to do that thing. And what's the best way to do that thing right now for my particular circumstance. And that I'd say is about 80% of what differentiates a beginner with ArcGIS and someone who's more knowledgeable or has more experience is that they know which one of those three ways for any given task is the best way or the most efficient way to, uh, to get, get something accomplished. So if I want to, uh, I said I wanted to cover one other thing here. Uh, okay, another chat. Uh, and it's 27 dialogue boxes down. Uh, sometimes that's true. Um, I, although I would say it's not as many dialogue boxes down in pro as it was maybe in desktop. But I could I could be wrong about that. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move back to my map now that we've covered how to make a layout. And uh, of course, um, the thing I didn't say here is that you can also um, you can also print that from right here in ArcGIS if you want to. You don't, you don't have to save it to PDF before you print or anything else. That all can happen from here as well. Um, so hard copy or, or soft copy uh, are both possible here from, from your layout mode. So the last thing I wanted to kind of look at here, I'm going to run back to my uh, to my aerial photo here. Is that you know we have some some uh, trails and some other features on here that we maybe want to uh, look at adding into our data set. And I, I went through this in QGIS as well, so I'll, I'll do it here for uh, consistency's sake. But we may want to create our own data not something that we imported from a program that already created our data. And that's where we need to get into how do we make that happen inside of Pro. So I'm gonna to go to my, my project folder that I was created as a default. It's still empty right now because we haven't added anything to it. We added our shape files directly to our project over here. Um, now we could import those into our geodatabase if we want to, um, but we, we're not required to. But I wanna create a new what's called a feature class. And inside the, the geodatabase, a feature class is the equivalent of a shapefile. So I'll, I'll say I want to create a new feature class. Uh, I have to give it a name, call it trails. I have to tell it what type of geometry is going to be stored in there. So if you're familiar with GIS, you know about points, lines, and polygons. These are the three basic geometry types we store. So we're going to store some lines here. And I've got a bunch of other uh, uh, panels here that I can add some attribute fields if I want. I can choose a, a uh, coordinate system and saying, hey, you're already using this coordinate system. Do you want to keep using it? I can just select that and say, yep, just keep using that. Uh, some tolerances, you'll probably never mess with any of these panels. And so at any point in this process, you can just say, you know what? I'm cool with all the defaults for the rest of this. Just finish that up and create that feature class. So it's adding that feature class to our database. And now if we look in catalog, we have a new feature class uh, that we can just drag and drop into our project. So now I have trails. That's definitely going to be hard to see, so I'm going to make that uh, something a little more obnoxious. Let's make that red and make that like four points. So now if I'm ready, uh, I can start editing my, my map and adding this line work to my map. So the way I would do that is highlight my layer and come up here to the edit menu at the top. And I say, I wanna create a feature. That's gonna pop out my features panel over here and say, okay, I wanna draw trails. And then I just start drawing trails. So I'll draw down this direction. 
And when I'm done, I can double click. You see this panel that popped up here. This is called my snapping toolbar. So this will allow me to, to snap to features. But I know it's, it's committed whenever it, it turns blue like that. And then I can come back and start my, my next feature. And maybe add one little final one in here. So these are all different line segments uh, and that I can attribute and say, okay, this road is um, not passable unless you have a four wheel drive. I could add my own annotation about how we did ridge walking along this road and we didn't find anything. You know, one of the things uh, that I used early on when I learned GIS for ridge walking is I would work with the plat book, which is land ownership, all the parcel information. And I would uh, create a GIS for our county area and I would mark off areas that we ridge walk and show, I found it to be just as important to show where there were no caves found as where we did find caves so that people didn't go back and look there time and time again for caves. So you can do that with polygon shapes and that's certainly a, a very uh, productive use of GIS as well. But you can see, get an idea here for how easy it is to add geometry on your own. Um, you may want to add some characteristics around wooded areas and things like that as well. Once you've made whatever changes you want to make, you just click the save icon. Um, yep, we're going to save all of our edits. And all of those changes then are, are committed to the database. So we can add this shape file to another project. We can send it off to another program. We can add it to different uh, layers. We can still make changes to it through editing. But that's been permanently saved onto our, our geo database into our project file at that point. So um, we are just about at time here, uh, top of the hour for this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there with the things that I've kind of been going through. Um, again, I was trying to show a lot of the things that we did with the QGIS tutorial as well. So you can kind of go back and forth and see how those things might. Uh, compare how you would do it in one program versus another program. Um, but hopefully this gives you at least a very introductory idea of some of the things that you can do with ArcGIS Pro and how you navigate around in GIS Pro. Um, I fully understand that this is by no means a complete introduction uh, presentation or talk about it, but I'm trying to focus on individual tasks that I hear and get questions on quite a lot about how do I do this simple thing in GIS that's been incredibly frustrating for me. So uh, I'll stop there.